LORAN stands for Long Range Navigation. It was a joint US-UK design navigation aid similar to the UK's successful G-System but able to be used at much longer ranges such as around the Pacific. First and foremost let's look at the difference between ground waves and sky waves. Performance wise G had a range limit of around 400 miles as it only used ground waves. These follow the curvature of the Earth. Loran also used ground waves but in addition used sky waves at a level in the ionosphere called the E layer and the F layer. When using the sky waves the range of Loran increased up to a maximum of around 2000 miles at best. This was at night when the conditions were most favourable. Ask anyone who listens to shortwave and they'll tell you how many more distant stations are received after dark as the signal bounces between the earth and the ionosphere. If we take a look at a line on the Loran display showing both ground and sky wave signals, we see that due to the extra time it takes for the signal to go up to the ionosphere and come back down again, a sky wave blip on the display will always appear after the ground wave pulse. Here we can see the track of a ground wave following the curvature of the Earth. A sky wave with one hop E is noticeably further, as is two hops up and back, and even further for a single hop up to the F layer and back. To make a navigation fix using Loran, first and foremost the navigator will need to make a dead reckoning fix. This is a traditional method for obtaining an approximate location using speed and direction, taking into account other factors such as the wind speed etc. Once he has this information it will then be possible to refer to the chart and identify the two correct master and slave transmission pairs in order to make a more accurate fix using Loran. Note that a minimum of two separate fixes or preferably three will be needed for greater accuracy. Here we'll see just one of these being carried out. Moving over to the Loran navigation indicator, the operator changes the channel selector to one of the settings recommended by the chart. Note that he'll be looking for the recognised signal pulses on the display. Signals are originating from a master station at Cape Fear in North Carolina with a slave being at the Jupiter Inlet in Florida. For the purpose of this demonstration, the aircraft is heading towards Barbados from the west. Here is a closer look at the signal pulses as seen on the Loran indicator screen. The first smaller one to the left is the ground wave followed by a larger one hoppy and two hoppies to the right of this. Switching to function 2 will enable the correct signal to be selected and lined up. Using function 2 the pulses are enlarged and separated on the top line. It's straight away interesting to note that there is in fact a fourth pulse to the right of the two hop E but a lot smaller. Logical to assume that this is in fact a one hop F signal, if you recall the illustration you saw earlier on showing the ionosphere. In the scene here we can see that the navigator has chosen the large one hop E pulse he wishes to use by adjusting the position and size of the marker on the bottom line. The idea being to line it up as closely as possible with the selected one hop E above before switching to function 3. With the display now switched to function 3, the two traces are superimposed in order to make easy any final adjustments that need for pulse matching. Function 4 allows the navigator to take first rough reading by counting the number of upward facing pulses before they reach the downward facing blip. In this case it looks like something over 7 spikes. The figure has to be noted down on a piece of paper. On switching to function 5 we see a much more complicated screen from which remaining part of the navigation fix can be obtained. Note that the two important markers are the second pulse in on the bottom line and the first pulse in on the top right. The navigator will need to count the pulses between the two of these. First of all there are seven pulses up to the second large pulse on the top line. Now all that remains is to count the little pulses up to the second large marker on the bottom line. There appear to be six of these and a fraction of a pulse. It may be easier to use the controls at this point to increase the size of these to a more accurate reading. The camera position is in fact showing a parallel accelerator on the last fraction which should read 2. These figures should now be written down to calculate the final position fix. A 7 from function 4, another 7 from the first, set of markers on function 5, 
then a 6 and about a quarter of a division on the last portion of the left hand marker. Add these together and you have 7762 plus another 100 microseconds to be added for the delay in the indicator which equals a total of 7862. Our first fix is to be applied to the chart. This is now the conclusion of our short demonstration how to take a basic Loran fix. Remember that a minimum of two of these will be required. Place an X on the chart. Adding a third fix will of course increase the accuracy. If you'd like to see a complete unbroken sequence of taking a Loran fix with an appropriate background soundtrack then please keep watching. If else, I hope you enjoyed the video.